done. So we have our representation bubble here. And we can draw DNA helicase. I'm going to call it helicase. And that's unwinding the DNA. And you'll have a helicase at each replication fork. And then there are single-stranded DNA binding proteins. That's, this, that's the shark for single-stranded DNA binding protein. Right. Those guys are binding to all the exposed hydrogen bonds here, or uh, satisfying the hydrogen bonds sort of temporarily. So it, when we'll learn in the uh, cancer section of the course a little bit more, um, there is, cancer is a huge, huge problem for a multicellular organism like this. It's very, very easy for that to happen. And so our systems have many, many protections to try to block that. Um, one of these is tight control over DNA replication. So if we have the DNA strand like this, and say we transcribe, and when we transcribe, you know, we open up a based on the same idea as a replication bubble. So that RNA polymerase can come in and start making an RNA transcript off of this. If DNA polymerase is around, DNA polymerase potentially could also get in there and make a DNA copy of that. And this would be a problem for the cell. If this were to happen repeatedly, we might actually get a whole DNA made. Such there, there'd be an extra copy of all of this DNA, and there'd be an extra copy of the gene. So when transcription, transcription factors around transcribing this stuff, you would get extra transcripts off of it. And we learned, like in the calcul cats and the X chromosome, dosage is important. So if you have bits and pieces of extra chromosome hanging around, you have the wrong dosage. You want your genome to be exactly 2N. So one of the protections of this is that DNA polymerase cannot start all by itself. If you remember from transcription, what happens is the RNA polymerase binds to the promoter, measures out a set distance, melts the DNA, it takes the first nucleotide and lines it on there, puts the second nucleotide on there, lines it on there, and connects it. And now you have a two nucleotide messenger RNA, or an RNA started. There's a three prime, three prime hydroxyl on which you can add onto there, right? That process was going. Yeah, did it go well? Yes, that's really well. good. That process of de novo or new, starting new, de novo creation of a nucleotide um, of a nucleic acid, a piece of DNA or RNA, is restricted to only RNA polymerases. The three-dimensional shape of DNA polymerase is such that it cannot grab a nucleotide out and line that up and grab a second nucleotide out and connect those to start a nucleotide, um, a chain, right? So the rule is, and to the best of my knowledge, there is no exception to this, DNA polymerase cannot start with nothing. DNA polymerase must have a three prime hydroxyl on which to add. And that is a protection against cancer for this type of thing happening. You don't want this to happen. So when DNA replication is going to occur, how does DNA polymerase get started? DNA polymerase doesn't get the whole thing started. What happens is a molecule, basically an RNA, polym RNA polymerase comes in. We call it RNA primase. It makes an RNA primer. That RNA primer is made like this. That's five and that's three, right? So this is a three prime hydroxyl hanging off here, right? And then RNA primase also comes in and puts one on this side here. Right? Now there is a three prime hydroxyl. Yes, it's RNA. But it's all right, it's a 3' hydroxyl, and DNA polymerase can go off of that. 
So once RNA primase comes in, it makes an RNA primer, DNA polymerase can now come in and make the copy. Which direction? Does it start from over here or does it start from over here? If you're seeing over there, then we'll see over here. Good. That would be you silly if you said it extended off the five prime end. Right? I don't know. Huh? What? Okay. So, DNA polymerase comes in. You can now add on to this. And it goes around like that. And it uses the nucleotides to put in the complementary strand. Same thing here. And we're left with the three prime hydroxyl, right? We can add on to that. So as helicase goes and unwinds this, we can keep adding and extending this on down. So then what comes in and adds some DNA onto this side right here? You said that? You have to have the latter of the focus off your five minutes going by. You cannot add on to, the only time you can possibly add on to the five prime end is when you cap it. Right? Seven methylglinine cap. What happens is, how you copy this is RNA primase comes in and makes an RNA primer here. And then a different DNA polymerase comes in and adds onto this here. Until it bumps, for right now, we'll say until it bumps into the other one. Okay? So if this was our origin of replication, that's the first thing that opened up. As this thing opens up this way, so also we're going to get this right here, right? We have an RNA primer that, sorry, an RNA primer that comes in. And we can make this piece of DNA out of this. So as helicase operates, and we open up the replication bubble even further, this guy can go continually, right? You just keep adding onto the three prime end. But now we have another problem. We've got all this stuff here. So another RNA primase needs to come in and put another RNA primer here so that we can extend this like this. Does that make sense? This guy is not covalently connected there. And this guy is not covalently connected here. But this guy is all continuous because you're just adding into the three prime end. So this is called the continual strand and it's called the leading strand. This is called the discontinuous strand. It's actually called the lagging strand. Right? As this thing ex expands out, <coughs> and this case operates, This guy can keep going, right? So this guy is now the leading strand. And this guy, we need to add a primer here. We can extend that off this way like that. I guess I had another primer here. Right? That's what I had before. So that these are the lagging strands, right? From a replication bubble, you have a leading strand, and a leading strand, and a lagging strand, and a lagging strand. Okay. I've done this really simple. Any questions to this point? What determines where the uh, voice replication is? Like, it just have to open up on its own? Just Naturally, or does not go to the next spot to open up? The question is what determines where the origin of replication is? In bacteria, there is a defined DNA sequence, there are proteins that bind to it, and they distort the shape 
and they open up and melt the DNA. They actually all bind in one spot and they just store it around. They have a lot of positive charges that interact with the negative of the DNA backbone that allows the DNA to get kind of melty and it un unravels the DNA there. To the best of my knowledge, no one has ever found the DNA sequence, which is the origin of replication in humans. We have no idea. And so people say, it happens randomly, which I'm not sure I believe. Okay. So, our genome then is after a replication, if it's just as I've described here, we'll have little pieces of RNA amid our DNA, our, D, our DNA chromosomes will actually have little pieces of RNA in them. And these are not covalently connected to each other. Right? Here. I guess this one is. Sorry, I did that one. These are covalently connected because you extended off of this 3 prime hydroxyl and off that one. So this connection here is complete. That sugar phosphate backbone is not intact. And it turns out what DNA polymerase does is it's rolling down and adding on nucleotides. If there's something in its way, it's got like a little mouth on front of it and it just chews its stuff away. So what actually happens is as this DNA polymerase is rolling along, when it bumps into this RNA primer, it eats it up and adds the nucleotide in its place. And then it eats this guy and this one and this one and this one and this one and now it's into the DNA. And it just keeps going. And it just keeps eat, eating away. It's, it's duplicating its effort. We've already got a DNA copy of that. DNA polymerase doesn't care. It just chomps its way through and keeps adding nucleotides on behind it until eventually it falls off by chance. Make sense? It seems wasteful. So that's the way it works. That's the way it appears to work. But we still don't have this covalently connected to this. So let's say the DNA polymerase falls off. And then there's this enzyme called DNA ligase that comes in. And DNA ligase connects the sugar phosphate backbones. And now we're happy. Intact. Any questions on this? DNA polymerase cannot start DNA replication on its own. It can only add on to an existing 3' hydroxyl. This is why, what, another reason why you ordered and you designed and ordered a primer for your PCR reactions. TAC cannot start on its own. It has to have a 3' hydroxyl, and you offer that in your PCR reactions in the form of the primer hybridized to your DNA. It's a 3' hydroxyl that hanging off that TAC can add off of, right? In a circular genome, like bacteria, when the genomes get replicated, you wind up with genomes that are linked together like this. Like if you were to take key rings, here we go, like the main ring on here and this ring here, they're linked together. I'm not a magician. Our cell's a magician that they can like, and then they come apart. No, thank you. It's toboisomerase again. Comes in, breaks the sugar phosphate backbone such that the rings, one of them gets separated and then they can be separated like that and then the chromosomes can go to the daughter cells. In bacteria, they don't call it toboisomerase. In bacteria, they call it gyrase. We have a couple videos. Should we watch videos today on Friday before spring break? Let's see if I can get this to load up here quickly. I hope these are still valid. DNA replication is wow. defined 
as the process by which an organism is used as a template for the production of a new wow. elementary DNA strand. Dark here. Answer to yourself. <laughs> an enzyme called helicase unwinds the original DNA's double helix, creating a replication form. Next, an enzyme named DNA polymerase 3 works down the leading strand and up the lagging strand of the replication form, synthesizing two new strands of DNA by taking free nucleotides and pairing them with the complementary bases on the original DNA template. The process of DNA replication is described as semi-conservative because the two copies of DNA produced each contain one strand of the original DNA and one entirely new DNA strand. Okay, that was great. I think this is the one I want next. This guy's awesome. This is crazy good. That didn't work. New primer. Now that just ran into the other primer. Enters the production line from bottom left. The world See, it's all filling out. It's going to pump there. Pump to the other. They show pumping into there. Should actually. It spins the DNA as fast as a jet engine as it unwinds the double helix. So this is probably the RNA. Primer. This is DNA polymerase. This is an RNA primer. One strand is copied continuously and can be seen spooling off to the right. This is supposedly real time. Things are not so simple for the other strand because it must be copied backwards. It is drawn out repeatedly in loops and copied one section at a time. The end result is two new DNA molecules. Okay. Here's just another illustration of this. This is probably the uh, RNA primer, is this little thing here? Yes, I'll probably show that to anyway. You guys have any questions on this stuff? You should have talked about this in general bio too, right? Okay, this is really interesting. So as DNA polymerase is running down, it's got a three prime hydroxyl here, it says okay, uh, this is an A, so I need a T. It grabs a T, puts it on. Oh, this is a G, I need a C. It grabs a G, uh, that doesn't fit. Throw it away. This is an A, that's the wrong fit. Here's my C, bam, it clicks in. Next one is a T, so I need an A. Here's a T, click, oh, it happens, you know, I happen to force click it in, off I go. Now we have a T that's not able to hybridize to a T. But it's covalently connected under the three prime hydroxyl. So it's the new 3' hydroxyl. Now we've got an error. That happens about every 100 bases or so. But the DNA polymerase has what's called a proof reading mechanism. As it moves forward, and it now has the 3', three prime hydroxyl of the T that's hybridized to this T, those T's don't hybridize properly. They don't have the right hydrogen bond partner pairings. And so this T actually kind of bulges out. And now the polymerase can't reach and find out what the next nucleotide is that needs to match up here. So when the polymerase gets in that context, it actually chews this one back out, and it puts a different nucleotide in. So DNA polymerase has a proofreading mechanism. So all I guess here is this one at a thousand base pairs it puts in incorrectly. It 
has a proofreading function. So a mismatch, if a mismatch base is put in place, polymerase stalls, takes a step backward, removes the mismatch base, and then moves forward again. Okay. So proofreading is not enough to get the accuracy. So your DNA polymerase makes an error about one every 100 million base pairs. When your genome is replicated, you've got a 320 million base pair, or is that right? No, 3.2 billion. So when you were a fertilized egg, and that cell copied its genome and divided, we say those cells are genetically identical to each other, right? The reality is if you were to sequence the genome of this daughter cell and sequence the genome of this daughter cell, there would be nucleotide differences between them. So if an error is made, one every, what do we say? 100,000? 100 million. So what's that? There's 32 differences. 32 nucleotides were added incorrectly. In the proofreading, so if, if, it, if the polymerase adds a one in a thousand wrong and then does proofreading to take it back and fix it, even though sometimes the proofreading mechanism doesn't work right, it just moves right through. So maybe we're only at one in a hundred thousand. So there has to be a mechanism to get, I'm not doing this right. Let me, let me try to draw this another way. base goes one in a thousand. Proofreading takes that out almost every time, takes that out, and then we get the correct nucleotide. So let's say that's a thousand times more efficient. Even if we get to a thousand times more efficient, that only goes down to there, right? So when the genome is actually replicated and the polymerases are all done, there's probably a hundred times more mutations than the final product once the cell's been around for a little bit. Does this make sense? During DNA replication, during replication, and this is after replication. So even though there's a proofreading function, somehow there's a further improvement from the moment DNA replication gets done to the time the cell's a day old. In this day between the end of DNA replication, there needs to be some way of correcting this. Somehow the cell is able to recognize it has mutations. It's got, it's got an A trying to hybridize to a C that was missed in all of this process. Does that make sense? You guys are totally bored or totally lost? Good? Alex is good, so we're moving on. Mm -hmm. Okay? So there has to be a way. If this is, you know, if this strand's going this way and this strand's going this way, who says the A is incorrect? So you all think the C is the one that's wrong. Alright, we're gonna take a vote. Everyone must vote. Who says the A is the nucleotide that's wrong? Who says the C is the nucleotide that's wrong? Uh, that's about 50-50. Right. So the cell is replicated its genome, the polymerases are long gone. Which which strand is correct? We don't know. We don't know. Oh yeah, you know. Okay, so I read this cardboard earlier and something about like methylated strands. Ah, yeah, yeah. So something that's methylated is usually an old, older strand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Great. that's how, by the way. Very good. So it turns out, what we start with is, remember we have this, we have a, we have a chromosome and that thing's going to get replicated. It turns out our DNA gets covalent modifications to it. We've learned DNA consists of adenine and guanine and thymine and cytosine, these things. Once the DNA is made, there's an enzyme that goes around and anytime it finds a convenient spot, it puts a methyl group 
on the DNA. So if you have a piece of DNA, if you have a chromosome that's been hanging out inside a cell for a year, there are methyl groups all over that, that chromosome. So when this genome gets replicated, what you're going to wind up with is one chromosome has a whole bunch of methyl groups on it, right? And the other strand is brand new. And those guys don't have any methyl groups on them. And this guy over here, of course, was copied. So this strand is also bare of methyl groups. So if we have our A, and we have our C, and this is a mismatch here, there's DNA repair machinery that comes in. And it says, hey, I've got something. What happens is the DNA, because these guys can't hybridize, and they don't want to be around each other, what they do is actually, they actually physically bulge out into space like this. So the DNA repair just kind of rides along, and when it hits one of these little bumps, it says, oh, we got a mistake here. Which nucleotide is the correct nucleotide? Well, this guy has methyl groups all over it, so it's been around for a long time. And this guy has no methyl groups on it, so this guy's brand new. This guy must be wrong. And we'll learn about DNA repair mechanisms later. Basically, the A gets popped out, and then a polymerase comes in and tries to fix that again. Now, if this thing has been around an hour, there's not many methyl groups on it. If it, this thing's been around a day, it started that enzyme that adds methyl groups, it's starting to add methyl groups onto this thing. If this thing has been around a week, there's a lot of methyl groups on this thing. So if this thing is an hour old, it may, just by odd chance, get a methyl group right by that A. When the DNA repair mechanism comes along and says, oh, we've got a mismatch, one of you guys is wrong, well, whoever has no methyl groups, that's the one that's wrong. And if it says, oh, crap, I got a methyl group here and I got a methyl group here, I don't know which one is wrong. I don't know which one's old and I don't know which one's new. And so it goes, uh, does it go to the next one over? No. It says, I'm going to change like this one this time. That's right. And so there's this whole protective mechanism to try to prevent mutations from occurring. All of these protective me mechanisms are not entirely perfect. Every time one of your cell divides, the cells are different at 32 spots. 32 nucleotides are different. So. Your body is 10 trillion cells. How many cell divisions happened to get you to 10 trillion cells? There's a lot of mutations, right? You're, you are not composed of all genetically identical cells. Um, that's why, does anyone have, ever have a friend? I had a, a, an acquaintance of mine in high school. She had a brown eye and a blue eye. Probably what happened is as the cells were dividing, she got a mutation in the gene that was eye color. And this part of her says brown eyes, and this part of her, there's a mutation that's destroyed the brown eye allele, so she's got a blue eye around the side. Actually, I think she's blue and green is what she was. Does one eye hurt more if it's like brighter outside? Um, I don't know, I've never asked that question. I think, I think she said that was all I'm just totally fine. Can you talk more about the methyl groups and why they're put there? We will. Yes, not at this point. I'm introducing that DNA can be methylated. And then I'm going to get you really messed up about it. Really confusing. So, is 
is it just a common occurrence for geneticists and people that study genetics to wonder why anything is alive at all? <laughs> yeah, uh, this is what I was getting to when I was talking about before. You could come in thinking evolution, and then you're like, how could this possibly be? How can anything be alive? How can anything, how, with all this weird crap going, how could this sort of mechanism evolve to be? Tell me, like, continue random chemical reactions, thousands of years. random chemical reactions to methylate the DNA, and this was more advantageous, and so this came to be. You buy it? Sure. <laughs> At this point, you're like, I give up. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever. It, it seems to work, so it doesn't have to make and sense. And so evolution would act on it, and then that would be the way that would survive. And anything that didn't methylate its DNA would be selected out. The lions would eat them, and so those genes would be passed on. So things with the genes to methylate DNA. That's that's the proposal. Yes. How do you get to this state? I don't know. I may only be open to you guys to decide that. I'm just telling you the way it is. This is what we found through experimentation. Pretty cool stuff. Okay. Eukaryotic chromosomes. To the best of my knowledge, no one has ever found the sequence of origin of ori in humans. We have no idea what it is. There, every chromosome appears to have many origins of replication. We don't know what it is. We know they exist. So we can actually run experiments where we can see the, the replication bubbles. This is double-stranded DNA coming here, and then the, this is a replication bubble here. So there's a replication fork and replication fork. So on this one chromosome that isolated, look at all the different replication bubbles that are forming on this thing. So there's a lot of these happening. And the replication bubbles, when they bump into each other, they fuse into one huge replication bubble. All right, I want to talk about telomeres. In the worksheet, I asked you to define the term telomere when you start to understand this. Telomere is the structure at the end of a chromosome. And it's a specific DNA sequence. We do know the sequence of this thing. And it does a very specific thing. So let's look at DNA replication, what we just learned about. Here we have a chromosome. We're going to separate the chromosome. And if we're going to copy this whole chromosome, we need to get, what's the first thing that we do? Let's say we've separated the strands. DNA, DNA polymerase coming in now? RNA primase comes in and makes a primer. So if I do a primer right here, and the three prime end is poking up here, I'm going to copy this stuff, and this stuff is just screwed, right? So let's say RNA primase is a way of knowing that this is the end of the DNA, and we need to put a primer right here, OK? And we'll extend the primer off that way. So RNA primers are made. We extend and make copies of our strands here. Now there's no DNA out here that the DNA polymerase could roll along and chew this stuff away and fill that back in with DNA, right? So this is RNA. There's no way DNA polymerase can, you can't chew this out and then add on to the five prime end. Nothing adds on to the five prime end except the capping enzyme, right? So over time, this RNA is really unstable. It actually fell apart. And so that RNA primer is degraded and left with a single-stranded piece of DNA here. The next time this cell divides, let's separate this, chrom this chromosome. I've got my original strand of DNA. This is my copy from the semi-conservative. And now this guy is shorter by that much. An RNA primer is going to be made here and work its way down. We have no idea what this sequence is. So when the polymerase gets here, it's just going to fall off. It's not going to make up sequence and say, oh, here we go. It's not going to go like, oh, yeah, I'm going to read off of here and add it on. You can't do that. So we get the primer made. Oops. We extend, and this guy is now shorter by the length of the RNA primer. And the next time this cell divides, that, that RNA primer is going to get destroyed. Separate the DNA strands. Our new RNA primer is made. We add that on. Look how short this chromosome is getting. Look 
compare the size of it to the original chromosome. Every time a cell replicates, it loses a little bit off of its ends. Absolutely, that's definitely, absolutely what happens. The telomeres get shorter after every cell division. How long, how much, how many times can a cell divide before there's no chromosome left? Well, you made it, right? So, organisms that have linear chromosomes with these telomere structures have to have a way of building that back up at some point. And that activity of adding on to the telomeres is restricted to two types of cells. Germ cells, germ cells are the cells that produce the gametes, the sperm and the egg. And the other cell type that's able to regenerate its telomeres is stem cells. And I mean, you know what, I just thought of a third cell type that can regenerate its telomeres. Anyone want to guess what that is? A cell that's dividing a lot. A cancer cell. If you have a cancer cell and it has no way of building its telomeres back up, its chromosomes get shorter and shorter until it's losing genes, and then the chromosomes are all gone, and then it's not a cancer cell anymore. That I, there are cancer cells in you right now that are going through that crisis and they're dying because of it. A successful cancer cell, in addition to getting stuck dividing and dividing and dividing and dividing, making lots more cancer cells, finds a way to turn on telomerase to build its chromosomes back up and not lose its genetic information. This is critical to sense that. So, the enzyme is called telomerase. The thing that rebuilds the telomeres. Telomerase consists of, for our purposes in this class, one protein and an RNA. And what happens is, this is the protein, and it's DNA polymerase. It's a variant of DNA polymerase. It's a type of DNA polymerase. And it's holding on to a little RNA. And the little RNA, the CCC of this RNA, hybridizes the GGG at the end of a chromosome. God, I got time to do this. Good. This is really, I just think this is the coolest thing in the world. What did we get? We got the overhanging was over here, right? Five, three, five, three. So these nucleotides hanging over the end here are C or GGG. And the DNA polymerase comes in and it has an RNA. And the RNA hybridizes like this. And then it is what is it? AATCC. Like this. What end is this? Three. Is there a hydroxyl there? No. Three prime hydroxyl. Now the DNA polymerase has a template. It can use this as a template and add nucleotides on here. So it says, oh, this is, needs to be a T. That's a T. That's an A. And a G, G, G. So we've added two, four, six nucleotides on. Does anyone see something on here? What do you see? Uh, another one will come in and buy it. You got it. We have three G's right here. And it's not a different one. Once this polymerase is added that on, once it's added it on, it like shifts this whole thing forward so that these three C's now hybridize to these three G's. And it adds on nucleotides, it shifts its way forward. It adds on nucleotides, it shifts its way forward. So that it can add hundreds of copies of this GGG AAT GGG sequence on. And that's how it goes. 
Isn't that hysterical? If you didn't have this RNA here, you'd be like, well, how the hell am I going to add on to this? I could just kind of like randomly put things on the three prime end. Mm -hmm. I'm like, what if I randomly build a gene from my sequence? It's just, you know, like monkeys typing, they might come up with a book, right? Even if monkeys typing on a typewriter, they might randomly, if you give infinite monkeys over infinite time, one of them would write, gone with the wind, <laughs> right? So then, it will continue, it'll make another, the CCC will hybridize here, so we get a T, T, A, G, 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 T, T, A, so on. Awesome! We've extended one chromosome. The other one is screwed, or one, one strand of this chromosome. The other strand is screwed, right? It's still only here. Oh, okay, yeah, so we'll add on to this end, great. Well, now this guy's screwed because it doesn't have all this. Travis, you have a solution? The primer bind further up and just build back. RNA primase comes in, builds an RNA primer here, that's a 3' hydroxyl, DNA polymerase, and then add on to that 3' hydroxyl, DNA ligase connects them, and now both strands are the same length. You guys understand? When I apply the term, pulling yourself up by your bootstraps, you know what that means? Telomerase is totally doing that in this sense. If you don't understand, stop by. Think about that, pulling yourself up by your bootstraps. You guys know what it means? Has anyone ever heard that before, pulling yourself up by your bootstraps? You'd be like, oh, I can't quite reach the ceiling. What I'm going to do is I'm going to grab my shoelaces, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull my shoelaces up, and now I'll be up here, and then I can stand up, my legs, my feet will be up here, and then I can stand up and touch. You know that doesn't work in the real world, right? But telomerase just did that. It didn't have anything to copy this, so it brought something with it. That's what, does that make sense? Anyway. Okay. So this telomerase is a really cool insight. And that's where we are today. When we come back to the spring break, we'll probably refresh a little bit on telomerase. As you shake the sand out of your boots, and um, can we turn that off? Have a great break, guys.